Good evening and welcome to the York Civil War Roundtable for the month of September. Uh, once again, it, it appears that we're online, as far as I can tell. Uh, we had to pivot back to our Zoom sessions, which we were doing for the better part of a year. Um, and uh, due to some unforeseen circumstances, we are back on Zoom. Uh, but of course, we never really left Zoom, which is a nice thing as well for those of you who have been at home. Um, my name is Adam Bentz, and I'm the Assistant Director of Library and Archives at the York County History Center, and uh, we're very happy to work with the Roundtable to host this event tonight. I always like to give credit to where credit is due uh, to the great team that is managing the Roundtable, um, Kathy Friel, the Program Director, and uh, her assistants, uh, we call them the two Scots, Scott Mingus, um, and Scott Rosenau, who both assist her in putting together what uh, has been a consistently high quality series of speakers for uh, as long as I can remember, uh, and a little bit over two years that I've been with the History Center. So uh, I'd like to get started tonight um, by talking about some upcoming events, uh, our obligatory discussion of these things. Uh, we have, as usual, a whole host of different events going on over the next few weeks and months, but uh, I just have a selection of things that I think will be interesting for people. Uh, first of all, tomorrow evening, that's the 16th of September, will be the History Center's annual meeting and awards event, and this will be taking place in person at the Historical Society Museum, but we will also uh, be live streaming this on Zoom. So uh, lots of different kinds of technology involved, which some of my code workers were setting up today uh, to make this happen uh, in our continuing uncertain times. Um, but uh, if you are interested uh, and you're a member, please uh, feel free to join us online uh, or, or check it out in person. I think you might still be able to register. There are a lot of details about this event on our website. And I believe that the doors open at 5 p.m. tomorrow night. So on September 18th, that is a Saturday, I believe, uh, Saturday between 9.30 and 1.30 in the afternoon, uh, we're having a long session of an online oral history volunteer training session uh, to be specific. And this is taking place on Zoom. Uh, and it's hosted uh, by Barry Loveland, who did a similar event for us last year during, uh, during our shutdown, I believe. And uh, once again, we'll be having this for anyone who's interested in conducting oral history interviews with people, uh, especially if you're interested in doing it, uh, to be able to gather information that we, uh, that we can share uh, at the History Center and document uh, to preserve people's stories for future generations. On September 22nd, that's a week from tonight, uh, most of you know, uh, every week after our roundtable events, the All Vets organization meets uh, at the History Center, and All Vets will be in person next, next Wednesday. Uh, they're meeting at 7 p.m. And we'll be welcoming Bob Smoker, who is a veteran of the 101st Airborne Division and served in Vietnam. And he'll be talking about his experiences. Uh, two days after that, on Friday the 24th, we will be having our uh, sort of, I'll say sort of annual art and leisure auction. We were unable to have it last year for obvious reasons, um, but uh, we were going to have it earlier this year. Uh, and then once again, things intervened and we postponed it till September. So uh, our art and leisure auction will be taking place virtually. But uh, as far as I know, we are still having this in person at the Agricultural and Industrial Museum on Princess Street. So uh, please, once again, check out the website for more details about that. And then on October 9th, uh, this is something that I really like to promote uh, and, and please feel free to share this event. We, we'd, like to, um, we'd like to invite people to come for our second Saturday lecture. That's at 1030 in the morning on October 9th. And we'll be welcoming a library volunteer, archives volunteer actually uh, named Jim Abels who will be presenting the National Guard of Pennsylvania, 1866 to 1900. So uh, this event, um, I'm sorry, his presentation is something he's been working on for some time. Uh, I've worked with him, uh, so he started volunteering for us uh, in 2021 
and has been doing some great work at researching some uh, military photographs we have in the collection at the History Center. He's extremely well informed, uh, and I think this would be a great presentation. So uh, I think this might be something very interesting for many of you tonight. All right. And then um, last but certainly not least, uh, in a month's time on October 20th, it seems really, really far off, but it isn't. Uh, on October 20th, the third Wednesday, we'll be having our next roundtable meeting at 7 p.m. At this point, I am not quite sure if we're going to be in person or on Zoom, so please stay tuned on that. Um, but we will be welcoming uh, Leon S. Reed, who will be giving a talk, No Greater Calamity for the Country, the North-South Conflict, Secession, and the Onset of the Civil War. The year-long crisis started with the first summer months of the 1860 presidential campaign and ended in the first major combat at Manassas is one of the most consequential 12 months in American history. Over that eventful year, one of the two major political parties shattered. Four regional candidates were nominated for president of the Democratic Party, and the minority supporting secession in southern states gradually shifted gradually to strong majorities. At the same time, many in the North who were inclined to shrug off the departure of southern states came round to strong opposition and answered President Lincoln's call for a volunteer army. In July 1861, a civil war started that was the most catastrophic event in the nation's history. The effects of the war were long lasting and are still some of the strongest economic and political influences in 21st century life. In his book, No Greater Calamity for the Country, North-South Conflict, Secession and the Onset of the Civil War, Mr. Reed uses hundreds of contemporary newspaper articles, diaries, and the contents of a never before seen contemporary scrapbook to explain how the country descended into civil war. So a uh, topic that I have not ex seen explored very much outside of academic conferences, um, the, the topic of why exactly this whole thing happened to begin with before the shooting started. Um, that will be the topic for our meeting next month. So at this point, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Matthew Borders, and he is a graduate of Michigan State University with a BA in history and a graduate of Eastern Michigan University with a master's of science in historic preservation, focusing on battlefield interpretation. Moving to Maryland in 2007 with his wife, uh, Kira, I hope, did I get that right, Matt? Um, he worked as a historian for the American Battlefield Program for six years. And over this period, he also became involved with the Frederick County Civil War Roundtable and is currently the president of that organization. Matt is also a certified battlefield guide for both Antietam National Battlefield and Harpers Ferry National Historic Site. Currently, Matt is a park ranger at the Monocacy National Battlefield in Frederick, Maryland. He continues to volunteer regularly as a living history volunteer, portraying federal infantry, and along with fellow guide Joe Stahl, has published two books, Faces of Union Soldiers at Antietam and Faces of Union Soldiers at South Mountain and Harpers Ferry. So uh, as we usually do, I'm gonna ask everybody in the audience tonight to save your questions for the end, or if you, you're worried that you're gonna forget, please feel free to put it into the chat function and we will definitely get to it, uh, provided we have the time. And thanks so much. And without further ado, uh, thank you for joining us, Matt. Oh, it's my pleasure. I thank you everyone for having me this evening. Um, I really appreciate Kathy and, and my good friend Scott Mingus for setting this up. And of course, Adam was extremely patient with me this evening. I had some technical difficulties with uh, my internet connection. So we're glad that we could make this happen. So I'm going to do a screen share. And see here and bring up my presentation. And tonight we're going to be talking about the last roll of the dice, the third Confederate invasion of the North in 1864. So we're going to be dealing with my site, my park, Monocacy National Battlefield here in Frederick County, Maryland. For those of you not familiar, Monocacy is the focal point of the third Confederate invasion in 1864. So 1862, Antietam, 63, Gettysburg, 1864, Monocacy on the way to Washington, DC. And we're gonna dive into that. 
But before we get into the details of the fighting at Monoxy, let's get a little bit of context. Because in the spring of 1864, Ulysses S. Grant has been brought from the Western theater of the war to the East, and he is made Lieutenant General and the General in Chief of all Union armies on March 9th, 1864. He is going to tell his commanders across the board to go to push the Confederates to the breaking point wherever they can be found. And as President Lincoln put it, those not skinning can hold a leg. Basically, if they're not actively fighting the Confederates, at the very least, they can keep their attention so they can't shift troops around on the federal armies. While we would have offensives in Louisiana, the Trans-Mississippi, Northern Georgia, we would have three separate armies operating in Virginia alone. Franz Siegel with, in the Shenandoah Valley with the Army of West Virginia, Benjamin Butler on the James River with the Army of the James, and of course, Major General George Gordon Meade on the Rapidan River with the Army of the Potomac. And it would be with the Army of the Potomac that Grant would make his headquarters. Now, this development and these movements would not go unnoticed by the Confederacy. In fact, Lee would famously state, we must destroy this army of Grants before he gets to the James River, lest it become a siege and then a mere matter of time. So Lee, the Confederate government, and thus his army is very well aware of what all of this movement across the board means. And here in the Eastern Theater, we of course would have the Overland campaign that would begin that spring. On May 4th, federal forces will step off, beginning the Overland Campaign, a series of extremely bloody engagements that would drive Lee's forces ever further south towards the Confederate capital of Richmond and its main supply depot at Petersburg. The Battle of the Wilderness, the opening engagement between Grant and Lee would be fought on May, 7th, May 5th through the 7th. Spotsylvania Courthouse, would follow May 8th through the 21st. The North Anna River, May 23rd to the 26th. Totopotomy Creek, May 28th to the 30th. And of course, following that, the terrible, terrible bloodletting that would occur at Cold Harbor, May 31st to June 12th, 1864. With this series of engagements, this terrible amount of loss, about 40,000 men approximately in about 40 days for the Union Army, it would succeed in driving Lee back to the very defenses of his capital at Richmond and, of course, the trenches of Petersburg as well, beginning the siege of Petersburg on June 15th, 1864. Now, this is not the only action occurring, though. With Grant's army, or excuse me, with Meade's army, the Army of the Potomac on the move, we also have federal forces moving in the Shenandoah Valley. Specifically, Major General Franz Siegel, commander of the West Virginia Department or the Army of West Virginia as it's sometimes referred to, he is going to go up against a former Vice President of the United States, Major General John C. Breckinridge, Department of Southwest Virginia. And these two would clash at the Battle of Newmarket, fought on May 15th, 1864. This would be a stunning defeat for Siegel, and the battle is probably best remembered for the use of the Virginia Military Institute cadets at the very climax of the fight. Breckenridge putting the boys in, and as he said, may God forgive me for the order. But these cadets would succeed in helping to split the center of the federal line and capture the batteries that were playing such havoc upon the Confederates. And Franz Siegel is sent fleeing back from the Shenandoah. With Siegel's defeat, it appears that the Shenandoah Valley is secured and Breckenridge would actually be ordered to join Lee's forces around Richmond. However, a new commanding officer for federal forces in the Shenandoah, David Hunter, would enter the game, if you will. And Hunter here is going to take those forces that he has, reorganize them, and once more head down, or excuse me, up the valley moving south. This would, of course, cause Confederates to return to the Shenandoah Valley, and John Breckenridge would be back in the Shenandoah 
by June 12th. Now, David Hunter is angling for Lynchburg specifically, a very important railroad town. It's a railroad crossroads. It's a supply depot and a hospital site that the Confederates are utilizing. But specifically, it's important because Lynchburg shifts supplies from the Shenandoah Valley along the rail lines to Richmond and Petersburg. It's literally helping feed Lee's army. And so while Robert E. Lee is loath to do it, he understands that Lynchburg must be secured. And so he will actually break off a portion of his command on June 12th under the command of Lieutenant General Jubal Early. Now Early here has recently been promoted to Lieutenant, Lieutenant General. He commands the Confederate Second Corps. Richard Ewell has gone into semi-retirement. He will be brought back right at the end of the war, but Richard Ewell believes he's gone into retirement and Early has now moved up to command of the Second Corps Army of Northern Virginia. We are gonna have a fight at Lynchburg on June 18th, 1864. And what happens is, is that Early and Breckenridge team up at Lynchburg. They've got between 15 and 18,000 troops with them, about the same number of men as David Hunter, but the Confederate command will actually succeed in tricking Hunter in believing that he is desperately outnumbered using the trains and also the bands and the very citizens of Lynchburg, they would make noise and, and uh, have the trains running all night on the night of June 17th. And Hunter begins tapping out messages to Washington that he believes he's outnumbered. He would say, he would write messages such as, I believe half Lee's army is in my front. I believe Lee's entire army has decamped and is now in my front. And so he will not stick around for long. The battle lines of June 18th, we would have fighting there at Lynchburg, but that night, believing he's heavily outnumbered, we would see Hunter retreat towards Liberty in the southern end of the Shenandoah Valley. Now we would have a pursuit by Jubal Early and a series of skirmishes and rearguard actions are going to occur as the Federal Army falls back from Lynchburg through the southern end of the Shenandoah Valley. They would fall back first to Liberty and move on towards Salem at the very edge of the, at the, of the Shenandoah. This would culminate at the Battle of Hanging Rock on June 21st, 1864, which is a fight many of you have probably never heard of. It's very, very small, but Confederate forces will succeed in attacking the rear guard of Hunter's force. They will actually damage part of his wagon train and force a number of cannon to be abandoned. And this is kind of the last straw for David Hunter. And at this point, he would retreat entirely from the Shenandoah Valley. This is a wartime map of the Battle of Hanging Rock, and I apologize for how small it is, but this would drive Hunter from the valley, leaving the door open for a movement north. That, of course, begins on June 22nd, 1864. We would have the march towards Buchanan. And then as Confederate forces are marching to Lexington, we would actually have a series of sightseeing events. Uh, the image I've provided here is actually from Natural Bridge. And there's accounts of numerous Confederate troops detouring off the main valley turnpike to go view this natural wonder. So doing a little sightseeing as they're, as they're pushing north through the Shenandoah Valley. Now by June 25th, they are actually gonna be moving into, <clears throat> excuse me, moving into Lexington. And here's the movement map. So Salem, Buchanan, Lexington, and then we have, um, all the way up there in the northern edge. If I can move my, uh, Stanton, of course. And Confederate forces are gonna be moving on parallel roads in the Valley Turnpike to try to save themselves some space on those roads. And then that little gold star that just appeared there, that's where Hanging Rock is and where they were detouring to. So not too far off the route. Early is gonna be heading for Stanton but as he is moving through Lexington, 
the Confederate forces that are with him are going to be surprised at how well preserved General Jackson's burial place is. In fact, according to J. Kelly Bennett, the assistant surgeon of the 8th Virginia Cavalry, though they had feared Hunter's federal troops had, would desecrate the burial spot of their beloved former commander, Bennett would note they did not touch the grave, but they did entirely destroy the head and footboards and nearly cut down the flagpole for mementos. So these guys are gathering souvenirs, but they're not actually disturbing the grave of Stonewall Jackson. An interesting realization for these Confederates. Now, Early himself would reach Stanton on June 26th. The army arrives the next day. It would be at this point in late June 1864 that Jubal Early is actually going to reorganize his command. We would have Early in overall command of what he now calls the Army of the Valley District, with John Breckinridge there as his second in command. We would have four divisions in this army, with John Brown Gordon and John Eccles under Breckinridge, along with Robert Rhodes and Stephen Ramsher directly under Early. So basically two small corps are in the neighborhood of about 15,000 men are now moving down the Shenandoah or northward through the Shenandoah Valley, heading for the northern end. And by the time they reach Winchester, they'll have marched about 200 miles. But to do this, they're actually going to severely reduce their wagon train. In fact, of these 15,000 men, the divisions will be reduced to one six horse wagon for a core headquarters, one four horse wagon for a division headquarters, and one four horse wagon for the brigades as well as one wagon for every 500 men. So even though they are reducing their vehicles and reducing their horsepower on this campaign, they're still gonna have a wagon train of about 400 vehicles. The Confederate Army will reach Winchester on July 2nd, 1864. And it's at this time that we would see Confederate troops beginning to, particularly the Confederate cavalry, beginning to stretch out and strike at the communications of federal forces. Particularly, they're going after the telegraph lines, they're going after the, the BNL Railroad that is not far from here. And they are moving towards Harper's Ferry. Now, at Harper's Ferry, we have, of course, Franz Siegel, who had been um, further to the west, but had fallen back to Harper's Ferry by this point. And the actual Harper's Ferry garrison is commanded by this gentleman we see here with the interesting mustache. That's Max Weber. Those of you familiar with uh, the Maryland campaign might recognize Weber as one of the brigade commanders that attacked under French's division at the Sunken Road on September 17th, 1862. These two gentlemen of German ancestry are going to now have the federal garrison at Harper's Ferry. They've also begun to send out word, or specifically there has been word sent to Washington from telegraph operators on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. There's Confederates out here, and there's a lot of them. But unfortunately, they're getting very little response from the War Department and Henry Halleck. Now, Martinsburg, which is where Franz Siegel was, was evacuated on July 2nd, and they would fall back again to Harper's Ferry. It is during this time that we would see John Garrett come into play, the president of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Garrett is going to help evacuate Martinsburg by providing cars and engines to move supplies. He is then going to eventually move himself all the way to Washington to try to dig up some help due to this Confederate raid. This raid, by the way, will actually arrive at Harper's Ferry or just outside of it on July 4th, 1864, Independence Day. This is the situation for Harper's Ferry in 64. We actually have federal forces there, uh, very similar to what they'd done in 62, sticking to Harper's Ferry proper, the town, 
but this time instead of allowing Confederate forces to bottle them up at the bottom of that bowl, below all that high ground, the federal garrison will actually abandon Harper's Ferry and fall back to the high ground above the town, specifically on Maryland Heights. And we can see some of the fortifications and camps there on this map. Now, yeah, go back to Harper's Ferry. Before we do that, before we move on into Maryland, uh, I just wanted to read a quick account of some of the Confederates because while Early has moved into Harper's Ferry and he's glaring up at Maryland Heights, his forces are gorging themselves on the federal supplies in Harper's Ferry. Specifically, there had been food laid out in the very streets of the town for the garrison in preparation for the 4th of July holiday. And as Thomas Morrow of the 8th Louisiana Infantry would write, our boys got the 4th of July dinner. They had all kinds of fruits, preserves, sardines, oysters, wines, and liquors, and any amount of meats. It was a great treat. So these Confederates are going to gorge themselves on those food stocks and supplies, but they're also going to get into the United States Army depots there. And we hear accounts of them getting new shoes, replacing worn out pants, so forth and so on. Now, Jubal Early later admitted that he would have loved to have captured the garrison of Harper's Ferry, as his predecessor had done two years before, today, 159 years ago, September 15th, 1862. But he doesn't have time. And so instead, he is going to shift north and cross the Potomac River near Shepherdstown, West Virginia on July 5th and 6th of 1864. And as the newspapers would account, Maryland invaded again. And many of them describe the annual raid of the Confederates as on once more, farmers fleeing northward, so forth and so on. While this movement is occurring, we would actually have another sightseeing expedition. Specifically, John Brown Gordon will give a tour of the Bloody Lane at what is today Antietam National Battlefield on July 5th and into the 6th. His forces will also be involved in skirmishing with the federal troops up on Maryland Heights on the 6th, kind of keeping them locked into those defenses so they don't come down and try to go after Early's rear. Now, we would also have the beginnings of the ransoms. When Early's forces cross into Maryland in early July, 1864, he begins ransoming towns. And John McCausland's Confederate cavalry will ride north on July 6th to Hagerstown, Maryland. They would push through a thin screen of Union cavalry just south of the town and enter the town and demand a series of payments. They want $20,000. They are also looking for 1,500 suits of clothes and 900 pair of underwear. Now, interestingly enough, most of the merchants in Hagerstown had been made aware of the approaching Confederates and they'd fled but the banks in the town will come up with the money and the town of Hagerstown would be spared any destruction due to them coming up with this $20,000. McCausland would leave. And as this is occurring, the Confederate infantry has continued to move east. They would enter Middletown, Maryland on July 8th. Now, Elements of the Confederate cavalry had already been through Middletown and demanded food of the citizens. But when Jubal Early arrives on July 8th, he would make a demand of $5,000 on the citizens of, <clears throat> excuse me, the citizens of Middletown. The problem is there's not five grand in the bank. There's about 1,500 in the bank and Early will take that. Now he'd hoped to stick around until the next day to bring in the rest of the funds from the surrounding countryside but fighting actually breaks out to the east of Middletown over the Catoctin Ridge outside Frederick, Maryland, and Early is forced to move on. So Middletown gets away with only paying that smaller amount. This is a sketch of uh, 
actually federal forces moving through Middletown in 1862, but it gives you a good impression of the troops moving through the town at that point. Now, while this has been going on, there has been some response by the federal government, and that's because of, once again, John Garrett. He has moved by special train out to Washington and later Baltimore to try to dig up some help for his railroad. He wants to preserve his livelihood and that of his company. And so he will actually find help in the shape of this gentleman, Major General Lou Wallace. Now, many of you are familiar with Wallace and his Civil War career earlier in the war, fighting very well at places like Fort Donelson and, of course, Shiloh in Tennessee. There would be some issues with Wallace's time out there in Shiloh, but he's probably best remembered today as an author. Lou Wallace would write a series of novels, including the very famous Ben-Hur after the American Civil War. But in July of 1864, Wallace is the commander of the Middle Department and 8th Union Corps, which sounds very impressive, but it's only about 3,300 men. He is going to begin moving his forces out on July 3rd and gathering them just east of Monocacy Junction here south of Frederick, Maryland on the 6th of July. And it would be his men that move off through Frederick, Maryland to the west of town on July 7th and 8th. We would have the Battle of West Frederick. This would be the inexperienced soldiers of Wallace's command that would fight west of town on the 7th and 8th. In fact, Wallace's men do so well on July 7th that he would telegraph Washington, I think I've just had the best little fight of the war, is how he describes it. But on July 8th, as more Confederates, led by this gentleman with the impressive goatee, Bradley Johnson, are moving through the Catoctin Mountain Passes, federal forces, such as the commander of the 8th Illinois Cavalry there, Clendenin, will not be able to hold the Confederate advance. And General Wallace recognizes that he must withdraw his forces from Frederick. They will fall back south of the city to the high ground just south of the Monocacy River. This will allow him to watch over two major crossing points, the wooden covered bridge on the Georgetown Pike and the Iron Railroad Bridge on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Fortunately for Wallace, by this point, the wheels of the War Department have begun to turn and Grant has been notified of this credible threat to the national capital. He would send reinforcements, specifically the 6th Corps by steamship up through the Chesapeake Bay all the way to Baltimore, where they would detrain and the 3rd Division, 6th Union Corps under Brigadier General James Ricketts would be sent by special train, once again provided by John Garrett, out to Monocacy Junction. Interestingly enough, Ricketts here actually has orders to go all the way to Harper's Ferry, because that was the last location that Confederate forces were confirmed to be at. But he would be stopped at Monocacy Junction by General Wallace. Wallace is a combat commander, Ricketts is a combat commander, and these two gentlemen determined that, look, in transit, the situation can change, the Confederates are here, and I need you here. And fortunately, Ricketts understands this. He would detrain his forces and bump up Union troop strength at Monocacy Junction to about 6,600 men, half of which are fairly inexperienced troops from Wallace, half of which are now veteran troops from the 6th Corps, with rickets. There's also seven cannon that are now at Monocacy Junction for the federal side, and all of these resources will be needed because the Confederate forces moving towards Frederick City and Monocacy Junction number in the neighborhood between 12 and 15,000 men and 38 cannon. A big difference in manpower and firepower here at Monocacy. And 3rd Division, 6th Union Corps is the Blue Cross, in case those of you who are curious. But as we mentioned, Wallace does evacuate Frederick, and he would have three objectives. 
he would fall back to the southeast side of the Monoxy River. And his objectives are to determine how big the Confederates are, where they're going, and then delay them as long as possible. That's what he's going to do at the fighting at Monocacy on July 9th. Now, something to keep in mind when talking about the Battle of Monocacy is, is that Jubal Early here is not looking for a fight. In 1862 and 1863, Confederate forces got above the Potomac River with the objective to fight Union forces. They wanted to win a victory on Union soil to affect a political, not only military, but also a political outcome. In 1864, Jubal Early is trying to get to Washington. He wants to get into the federal capital, force the government to flee, maybe burn some public buildings. He is not looking for a brawl on the banks of the Monocacy. As such, when his forces enter Frederick, Maryland, they are gonna begin moving out of town to the east heading down the Baltimore Pike, what is today Route 144, heading for Jug Bridge, a heavy stone bridge across the Monocacy that was guarded by three regiments of Ohio National Guard, the 144th Ohio, 149th, and the 159th Ohio Mounted Infantry. These three regiments are gonna put up such a good fight on the early morning hours of July 9th, 1864, that Confederate forces begin looking at other options for getting across the Monocacy. They will actually withdraw their troops at the Jug Bridge initially and begin moving down the Georgetown Pike, the direct road to Washington, D.C. And there they will run into the rest of Wallace's command. Now, this is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this is Brigadier General uh, Robert Lilly. It was actually his men that run into those Ohio National Guardsmen and are so stymied. Uh, he would eventually redeploy with the rest of Ramsher's division south. Now, Ramsher is going to move to the Georgetown Pike, this main road we see here in the middle of the map. In front of him is the high ground south of the Monocacy River. And on that high ground are federal forces, the majority of Wallace's command. In his immediate front, however, we have a thin line of Union skirmishers, about 300 men, approximately in line with the best farm lane that runs back to what is today Tour Stop 1 on Monocacy National Battlefield. These 300 soldiers are a mix from the 1st Maryland Potomac Home Brigade, the 9th New York Heavy Artillery, the 10th Vermont, and I believe there's a, a couple of troops from the 106th New York Infantry in there as well. But these men are going to grudgingly give ground over the course of the morning. Fighting begins at approximately 8.30 a.m. Some of the accounts have it as late as 9, but their grudging withdrawal back towards the railroad junction would delay the Confederates significantly that morning. And the Federals aren't gonna go away. They're gonna fall back into the railroad cut of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and basically use that as a trench for much of the morning. Now the forces engaged are not only Stephen Dotson Ramsher's division and those skirmishers from the Federal line, but we also have that difference in firepower we were talking about. All seven guns, six rifled pieces, and one 24-pound howitzer, which is the one we see here with the handles on top, are firing across that open ground on what is today the best farm. It's going to be because of this federal firepower on high ground that we don't see the heavy lines of battle um, moving across that landscape and just gobbling up the federal skirmishers. Instead, we are going to see a lot of small unit actions on the best farm throughout the morning of July 9th, a lot of skirmishing and artillery fire. And the Confederates are responding to the Federal artillery with their own pieces. Uh, of course, the 12 pound Napoleon here, of which at least 18 of these will be utilized by Early's forces during the battle. Now, as we said, Federal troops will give ground, eventually falling back behind the 
railroad cut of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, but they're still holding those crossing points. And thus Confederate troops are gonna begin once again, looking at other options for getting across the Monocacy. While all this is going on though, where's Jubal Early? Because he's not on the battlefield. He's actually back in Frederick, ransoming the town. Jubal Early has made his headquarters in Frederick, Maryland, and he is going to be in the home of Dr. Hammond on the northwest corner of 2nd and Market Street. He would be doing most of his negotiations at Town Hall there on Market Street. In today, for those of you familiar with Frederick, Maryland, is a very nice restaurant known as Brewer's Alley. It would be there that Early would make a demand of $200,000 in federal greenbacks or paper money on the citizens of Frederick or $50,000 in goods for his medical, commissary, ordinance, and quartermaster's departments. So again, adding up to about $200,000. In addition, he is also going to make demands of 500 flour barrels, 6,000 pounds of sugar, 3,000 pounds of coffee, 3,000 pounds of salt, and 20 thousand pounds of bacon. Taking these demands, and this is actually a, uh, an image of the ransom demands, but taking these demands would be Mayor William Cole of Frederick, Maryland. And he is going to buy for time throughout the morning of July 9th, 1864. Cole and the city fathers of Frederick really do not want to pay $200,000 if they can avoid it. That's about three and a half million dollars in today's money. It's a lot of money. And they have heard those Union troop trains coming in throughout July 8th and into the early morning hours of July 9th. They know Wallace has been reinforced. And their hope was that if the Federals can win at Monocacy Junction, the city won't have to pay. So they're going to be coming up with excuses and buying time and negotiating throughout the morning, trying to slow this payoff down, trying to slow this ransom down as much as possible. And Early is going to become very frustrated. In fact, so frustrated that he will turn over the negotiations to his staff officers and he leaves. He heads out towards the battlefield to figure out what's going on. Now, the ransom would eventually be paid, but it's not going to occur until much later in the afternoon, probably around four o'clock. The city fathers and, and Mayor Cole would hear the ever increasing sounds of battle to the south of Frederick. Things are obviously not going Lou Wallace's way, and they get together with five separate banks to come up with the $200,000 and pay that ransom in the afternoon of July 9th. Now, while all this has been occurring, Early's going to arrive on the battlefield. And when he does so, his commanders have already been looking at other options, like we said. And in fact, one of his cavalry commanders, a gentleman we've already heard a little bit about, John McCausland, has taken 20, uh, 1,200 troopers west down the Monocacy River looking for another crossing point. And he will find the Worthington McKinney Ford, a natural low spot with a hard bottom where he can get his horse mounted troopers over the river. They will blow through a company of the 8th Illinois Cavalry and move up onto the Worthington Plateau. Now, with the arrival of McCausland's men, we would see a response from the Union Army. Specifically, Lew Wallace describes McCausland's troopers getting up onto the Worthington farm in his after action report, describing the contemptuous waving of guidons off to his left. In other words, he can see their flags. And so he is gonna order James Ricketts veteran troops to shift to the east and face this new threat, excuse me, shift to the west and face this new threat. Ricketts would deploy a cloud of skirmishers in front of his men and General Wallace at around noon will order the wooden covered bridge across the Monocacy to be burned, denying that crossing point to the Confederates. And most of the defenders 
of these two bridges would be ordered back to the opposite side of the Monoxy, back to the Union lines at that time. Unfortunately, 75 men from the 10th Vermont Infantry suddenly realize their escape route is on fire. And so they are actually going to fall back to the Iron Railroad Bridge and be guarding that for much of the rest of the battle. Now, John McCausland's troopers are going to deploy into line. They dismount their horses, one of them later writing that we were told to tie up our horses or turn them loose. No man could be spared to hold them. So McCausland is putting as much punch as he can into his attack, and they're going to move across the Worthington property towards Thomas Farm. And it would be as they're approaching the property line between these two large farms that Ricketts veterans would rise up behind the fence line at that property line and pour a withering volley into McCausland's first attack, knocking those soldiers back to the Worthington property. At this point, we would have a bit of a lull on the field as John McCausland has just run into something far harder than any militia or 100 days men as he thought he was attacking. And we would see a lull around the Worthington property. Famously, a young Glenn Worthington, six years old, would watch this through the slats in his basement window. And young Glenn would become one of the first historians of this campaign later in life. By 2 p.m., however, John McCausland has figured out that the Union skirmish line only stretches so far to the south, and he would attack again around 2, forcing the federal line to fall back to what is today Araby Church Road. It was part of the Georgetown Pike in 1864. Now, with federal soldiers falling back to that line, Ricketts is going to throw in additional troops rally his men and counterattack. And it's at this point, we're gonna have the retaking of Thomas Farm and the repulse of this second Confederate attack, specifically done by the 1st Brigade, 3rd Division, 6th Union Corps, made up of the 14th New Jersey, the 106th New York, 151st New York, the 10th Vermont, and York, Pennsylvania's own 87th Pennsylvania Infantry. And it would be the aid to the commander of this brigade, Captain William H. Lannis of the 87th Pennsylvania, that would send the orders down to Colonel Truex, commanding the brigade, that it is believed that the Confederate line is faltering on its right and that General Wallace thinks an attack could drive those people. Captain Lannis here, 87th Pennsylvania, instead of informing Colonel Truex of this situation, takes it upon himself to order an attack. And he would actually ride up to the 14th New Jersey Infantry and the 87th Pennsylvania and order their commanders to attack up the Thomas Farm Lane and drive out the Confederates. They would succeed in doing so. Major Peter Vredenberg of the 14th New Jersey would actually write of this event. Our men at Thomas's gate then charged up his yard and across his fields, right up to his house and fought the rebels around the corner behind the trees and everywhere else till they retired behind the barn. So the 14th New Jersey and of course our 87th Pennsylvania is gonna be influential in knocking back this second Confederate attack and retaking Thomas Farm in the center of the battlefield. This will also allow federal forces to advance onto the Thomas Farm property and establish a new line of battle. While this has been going on, Jubal Early has had enough. Things are taking too long. And so at about 3 p.m., we would see the advance of Major General John Brown Gordon's Confederate infantry. About 3,500 men are going to be moved across the Monocacy River and go into line of battle across the toe of Brooks Hill, which is that big old hill right next to the Worthington Farm. They are now facing east and begin attacking across the open fields towards Thomas Farm and the federal line. Now, as Gordon's men are moving into position, we would have three brigades, Brigadier General Clement Evans, Brigadier General Zebulon York with the Louisianans, and of course the Virginia Brigade commanded by this very happy looking individual, Brigadier General William Terry. 
these three brigades are going to be the primary uh, force that Gordon would use in this attack. Now the federal line, we've already touched on 1st Brigade, Colonel William Truex's men, and the 2nd Brigade, Colonel Matthew McLennan. Now these forces are the veteran troops from the 6th Corps, and it would be against these veterans that Gordon's men would attack. As Gordon's men are falling into line of battle, the Confederate cavalry under McCausland tries one more time to break the federal line at Thomas Farm, and once more they would be knocked back. At this point, they would fall back through the very ranks of the Confederate infantry. Clement Evans of the Georgia Brigade would actually call out to his fellow Confederates, mocking the Confederate cavalry, telling his men, come on Georgians, let's show these cavalrymen how to fight. It's just 100 days men and can't stand up to our troops. So this idea that the Confederate infantry is now attacking militia and 100 days men is still the mindset of, the, of much of the Confederate high command, even though we know that these are the veterans of the Army of the Potomac that they're about to go against. And Clement Evans and his Georgians are going to have to eat some crow because three times this Georgia Brigade is going to attack that federal line and three times it's going to be knocked back. Clement Evans himself would be twice wounded, but these hammer blow strikes against the Union line are exactly what Gordon wanted because it's going to cause Union troops to be shifted to that threatened part of the line and force the rest of the federal line to be weakened. In fact, it is going to stretch out so far that it is no longer a double line of battle. It would be just a single line, a single line, excuse me, of troops across those fields. And it would be into this thin line that Gordon would unleash General York's Louisianans and General Terry's Virginia forces, forcing the Union line to fall back across Thomas Farm to the Georgetown Pike, again, today's Araby Church Road. It would be behind that road that federal forces would rally and repulse the Confederates for about another hour, from around four to about five in the evening. But by five in the evening, the Federal line is beginning to be outstretched on both its flanks. General Wallace is going has run out of long range ordnance for his artillery and he will order a retreat from the field. It is at this point that we would have one of the members of the 87th Pennsylvania Infantry uh, who is mortally wounded and his wounding was recorded by one of the officers of the regiment, Robert A. Daniel, in a letter he wrote to this gentleman's parents on August 9th, 1864. Whilst hotly, hotly engaged at the Battle of Monocacy, he received a wound through his arm, the ball passing entirely through his body near the heart. He was in all the charges of that terrible day's fight. And at the time he received his fatal wound, he was encouraging the men both by word and example with the use of his faithful musket, for he had already sent several of the miscreant foe to their final account. He received his wound just a few moments before we were compelled to fall back and evacuate our line, and we were so hotly pressed as to not be able to take him off the field. When he was asked just before we left our line if he had a request to make which he wished to communicate to his friends, he said, tell mother I am dying. And pointing to our flag just in front of him, he said, but in the defense of our glorious nationality and the protection of that dear flag. So these men will hold the line as long as possible against extremely trying odds. But by five o'clock in the evening, they will begin to fall back. Moving off to the Northeast, the final defense of the railroad bridge is also going to be abandoned at that time. A young George Davis of the 10th Vermont Infantry would actually receive the Medal of Honor for his actions of holding those two bridges for as long as he did. And I would like to thank for getting his men out of that situation as well. The Union line, while retreating to the Northwest, would also get a second Medal of Honor. Alexander Scott, a color corporal, he will actually scoop up his regimental flag. He was already carrying 
excuse me, he will scoop up the national colors. He was already carrying the regimental flag, but when he sees his color sergeant go down, he would then scoop up the national colors as well and retreats under fire carrying these two banners, saving them from disgrace of capture. So two medals of honor at the Battle of Monocacy, both of them happen to go to the 10th Vermont, interestingly enough. Now, as the federal line begins to retreat, it will fall back to the northeast, back up to the Baltimore Pike, Route 144, and then begins to move directly eastward. Confederate forces will pursue. And most of the Union casualties actually occur during this falling back from the field of battle. Several hundred Union POWs, POWs excuse me, would be gobbled up at this time. And the majority of casualties that actually occur are due to the POWs that are captured. We do have a brief clash in the streets of Urbana by the Union and Confederate cavalry. We also have at this time, Lew Wallace falling back with his command to a, the little town of Ellicott Mills, what is today known as Ellicott City, where he would telegraph both the War Department informing them that he is held as long as possible and that they need to do all that they can to make Washington secure. He would also telegraph John Garrett here, informing him that he held the Confederates as long as possible and defended Garrett's bridge as long as possible, but now he needs train cars to move his men back towards Baltimore. And he would end his telegraph to Garrett with, do not fail me. Of course, there is Henry Halleck, which Wallace was also communicating with, letting him know the details of the Confederate force as best he could tell. The cavalry clash at Urbana would actually get the Federals a brief win at the very end of the day. The 8th Illinois Cavalry would clash with the 17th Virginia Cavalry and succeed in capturing one of their battle flags, which is what we see here on the screen. The Nighthawk Rangers flag would be captured and later given to Wallace as a trophy of war. And that collection, or excuse me, that flag resides in the collection today at Monoxy National Battlefield. Now I'm going to wrap things up here because I know I'm getting a little short on time, but the cost of the Battle of Monocacy would be about 2,200 men. Approximately 900 Confederate troops killed, wounded, and missing in action, the vast majority of those being suffered by Gordon's division, and about 1,300 Federal soldiers, again, the bulk of those being POWs that are gobbled up near the end of the battle. Now, Jubal Early would rest his men for the rest of the 9th, but at dawn he does get his forces moving once again towards Washington. And July 10th and the 11th would be described as some of the hardest marching these veteran Confederate infantry would have during the war. But they would reach the outskirts of Washington on the mid-afternoon of July 11th. There is some preliminary skirmishing there outside of Washington. But Early wants to give time for his men to close up because they've become very uh, stretched out from stragglers due to heat exhaustion. And so he wants to let his army close up before the final push the next day. Unfortunately for Early, that is just the amount of time needed for the rest of the federal forces that are on their way to arrive. The 6th Corps and the 19th Corps, both moving into Washington, D.C., both moving into those fortifications around the National Capitol. The Veteran Reserve Corps also aiding in this effort and it would be these forces that would attack on July 11th that leads to the Battle of Fort Stevens and Early's repulse from the very gates of Washington. Now, Jubal Early would begin falling back on the evening of July 12th into the 13th towards Virginia, telling his staff officers, we may not have taken the federal capital, but we scared old Abe like hell. And that's probably true, because think about it. Abraham Lincoln is up for re-election in the fall. We have had the incredibly bloody campaign of the Overland campaign at the beginning of the year. The grinding siege, siege of Richmond has begun and shows no signs of letting up. Federal forces in the West are still moving against Atlanta but have not reached it yet. 
And now the Confederates have had the audacity to move up beyond the Potomac and make a run at Washington, D.C. itself. None of this is good. Lincoln is very concerned that he's not going to be reelected. And so that's why this battle here at Monocacy Junction is so important, because not only does it buy time for the Lincoln administration and Washington to be reinforced, but it would begin the resurrection of Lincoln's popularity as well, that we would eventually see lead to an overwhelming victory at the polls for Lincoln and the Republican Party in November of 1864. At the end of his after action report, Major General Lew Wallace wrote, these men died to save the national capital and they did save it. He had wanted a monument built to his men at Monocacy Junction. This map here shows one of the early designs or potential designs for the battlefield, one of the designs that was never made. But one thing that has been included at Monocacy National Battlefield, built in 1908, is the Pennsylvania State Monument, which is set up to the men that fought at Monocacy from the state of Pennsylvania, 87th PA, 138th Pennsylvania, and of course, elements of the 67th as well. So I have one last thing to leave you with this evening. It's actually a poem that was written about the 87th Pennsylvania for their time at Monocacy. This comes from the American Military History Institute, Carlisle. And this was actually done in 1897 as part of a memorial service, and this is the, the, uh, the gallant 87th. Recalled to City Point, we ship our on transports or the waves we skip, as through bound on pleasure trip, the gallant 87th. To save the capital, we speed, to Baltimore to Wallace aid, to check bold early in his raid, the gallant 87th. On July 9th, the foe we stayed, ah, what a glorious fight we made but what a bloody price was paid by bleeding 87th. Monocacy, the day ran red with blood by loyal heroes shed, all honor to the noble dead of the glorious 87th. For stall held the bloody field and not an inch of ground would yield till by triple force compelled the fighting 87th. Here Dietrich Welsh and Martin died, Walt Meyer Spangler and Hack beside, with their lifeblood, the daisies died, ah, the bleeding 87th. And Captain Lanius' gallant aide on staff of glorious 1st Brigade was found wherever duty led, as with the 87th. As orders to the left he bore to fall back, he was wounded sore while enfilading volleys tore the ranks of the 87th. But Washington was saved that day, as Grant and Sheridan both say, by the Battle of Monocacy and the gallant 87th. So thank you very much for having me this evening. It's been my pleasure to speak with you about the fighting at Monocacy Junction. Uh, again, I have a couple of books out there, The Faces of Union Soldiers at Antietam, and most recently, Faces of Union Soldiers at South Mountain and Harpers Ferry. Those can be found pretty much wherever books are sold. If you'd like to reach out to me directly, um, you can reach me at my Instagram at Matt Borders Books or at my email mborders at comcast.net. So again, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure speaking with you and I apologize for going a touch long. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, no, you didn't go long at all. Uh, that was very well timed. Uh, and um, I think we have, we already have a question in the Q&A, which I think we can start with that tonight, but if anyone else has questions, please feel free to put those into the chat or into the Q&A. And uh, let's get started. Uh, this question is from William. Um, were any claims made by the Frederick Banks for reimbursement for the ransom that they paid? That's a great question because yes, there were many claims made almost as soon as Early's raid was repulsed, there would be a request from uh, first state legislators and then the actual uh, members of Congress for reimbursement by the federal government for the losses to 
Frederick City, but also requests from Hagerstown and Middletown as well. None of that was ever paid. And the banks were not paid back until 1951. So it took them almost 100 years to do it, but through local taxes, the city of Frederick will pay off its bills or its debt, if you will. Uh, interestingly enough, the loan that the banks gave to the city was a very low interest rate, and so they really didn't make a lot of money on this. Uh, by the end, it was only about $600,000. So almost 100 years, only bumped up to $600,000 through interest. So that's not too terrible. But great question. And I'm just looking out there. Uh, oh, I should check Facebook. Let's see if we have any questions. But I do encourage you guys, if you haven't had the chance to visit Monocacy National Battlefield, we've got a great uh, little driving tour of the battlefield, takes you to all the, the pertinent stops and gets you as close to the river and the railroad as, as we're allowed to do, <laughs> basically. But uh, do come down and see us sometime in Frederick, Maryland. And uh, Adam, unless there's any other questions, I, again, thank you all very much for having me this evening. It, um... It does not. We usually have quite a few questions. I think it's probably because you answered everything. Well, I'm going to uh, hope it's that, that. That is my guess. Um, no, because uh, yeah, this is this is a, if you have any if you have anything to, to ask Matt at this point, this is your last chance. So. <laughs> but uh, wait, we do, we do. All right. Um, this is, this is a question I was wondering myself. Um, also in event in 1864, so uh, could you talk a little about McCausland's troops in their raid and burning of Chambersburg? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, that actually occurs at the end of the month in July of 1864, July 30th. What happens is, is that there's a really interesting period after early is repulsed and in northern, back in Northern Virginia, but before Sheridan takes over as commander of the forces in the Shenandoah Valley for the Union, we would have this three week peri period where Union and Confederate forces are sparring with one another, but there's no real good overall command for the Union strategy. And in part due to that, Early is able to order John McCausland, Tiger John and his Cavaliers north once again. They succeed in crossing over the Potomac and make that run at Chambersburg on the 30th. Now, the, the details of the Chambersburg raid are interesting because John McCausland will demand $500,000 from Chambersburg in federal greenbacks, paper money, or $100,000 in gold. Now, this is such a huge amount of money that the citizens of Chambersburg think he's joking. He can't be serious. And there's actually accounts of supposedly them laughing. Now, Tiger John is in no mood for uppity, as he would put it, uppity Yankees. Um, but the citizens of Chambersburg are certain that he doesn't have the time to do this. He would give them six hours, but the citizens in Chambersburg believe that Union cavalry is much closer than that and should be able to drive him away in the event that he doesn't give up on this plan himself. However, it would be both citizens of Chambersburg and some of John McCausland's own officers that would later claim he only gave the city three hours before he ordered the commercial district to be burned. And over 400 buildings would be destroyed in this burning of Chambersburg. Now, the reason that General Early would claim for ransoming these towns or, or using John McCausland to make demands of these towns is supposedly for the depredations done to the citizens of the Shenandoah Valley, particularly under David Hunter. And Hunter absolutely did burn some stuff in the valley, including VMI, which many officers north and south thought that that was completely beyond the pale. However, if we look at Early's career in 1863, so long before the instances in the Valley in 64, 
he had actually demanded a ransom of, well, you guys, York, during the Gettysburg campaign. So this is kind of his modus operandi already. So that's actually what happens in Chambersburg. Interestingly enough, that's the same day as the Battle of the Crater in front of uh, Petersburg. Um, it's a much debated question. I don't know if you if you know that matter or not, but it's a much debated question of whether or not um, they would have. And I, I'm not sure that there was any direct threat to burn York or burn part of York, but it was widely argued um, that York would be burned if they did not cooperate. And so um, Many historians have concluded over the last few decades that York surrendered, although, again, that's also contentious. Hmm. Um, but this question of burning is something I, I believe Scott uh, Mingus has written uh, quite a bit about and, you know, whether or not, I mean, it's one of those things that, that people will probably debate forever, but um, it's, you know, when you look back in situations like that, I mean, nobody wants their city burned. And the fact that they actually did do it to Chambersburg is, well, it's pretty definite proof that it could happen. Yeah, um, exactly. A lot of people, a lot of people just question whether it would have happened in, Ju in June of uh, 1863, which is a little bit before things started to get, enter that total war phase. Right, that particularly um, nasty uh, realm. Uh, Adam, was any sort of supplies or any sort of ransom rendered onto early in 63? Um, I don't honestly know. Yeah, the um, I don't have the numbers on top of my head. I'm going to I'm going to say and maybe somebody out there uh, has a copy of, of the book uh, of Flames Beyond Gettysburg. But uh, I think that they asked for 50 grand and something mm. like 23,000 was raised. Um, so it was it was less than half. Um, there were some other supplies that they were able to get, uh, but it wasn't it wasn't nearly all of what they wanted. Uh, nonetheless, they generally left the city alone. Interesting. I wonder if they just had to press on before all the funds could be raised or something to that extent. Because well, um, I admit I have uh, Flames Beyond Gettysburg in my stack, but I have not gotten through it yet. <laughs> um, well, um, they I mean, obviously, troops were sent to Wrightsville. And right. that became, I mean, that was the real focus. And of course, we can also speculate about what would have happened if they had been able to get across the bridge and which from a logistical perspective is just kind of fascinating um, because what if the bridge was burned after they crossed? Um, but anyway, um, in any event, you know, Wrightsville, Wrightsville caught on fire as a result of the bridge burning. So, you know, the Confederates actually it's, it's a great story. The Confederates actually helped the citizens of Wrightsville save the town. I think um, that was Gordon's troops again, too. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's really, you know, these things are just so, I mean, you know, we were, it was a civil war um, and people could respond in a variety of ways. So, all right. Well, uh, thanks so much. And I don't see any additional, let me, let me just a better double check Facebook. Um, I don't see any additional questions at this point. So yeah, um, I believe we are good to go for the night. So Excellent. yeah, well, again, thank you thank so you much for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right. And uh, we'll see everybody next month. Please stay tuned for more information uh, about how we are going to meet in October. And have a great night.